with the upheaval that's occurred across the Middle East, the U.S. administration, um, the Obama administration, has certainly been looking at Turkey as a model. And President Obama has been especially enthusiastic about Turkey. Uh, as his, in his first overseas trip as president, he explained, I think that's where the most promise of building stronger U.S.-Turkish relationships is in the recognition that Turkey and the United States can build a model partnership in which a predominantly Christian nation, a predominantly Muslim nation, can create a modern international community. And his declaration really reduced Turkey to its religion which fundamentally undercut many of the pro ataturk secularists who have advocated strongly for a separation of mosque and state. One can argue that when you insert any adjective in front of democracy, it basically undercuts the notion of democracy and Islamic democracy. I mean, if it's a democracy, it's a democracy, it's a democracy. One doesn't need to color it with religious or other terms. Likewise, Hillary Clinton had said in the wake of the Arab Spring, um, she said that Turkey had a lot of lessons to share with its neighbors in the Arab world. And so what I want to do is actually look at the developments in Turkey now, because if we're going to be treating Turkey as a model, it's important to recognize that the model to which many diplomats uh, speak about Turkey as this bridge between East and West, Turkey, which was our partner in the Korean War, was on the front line of the Cold War and so forth, might not be the model which many inside Turkey or the Middle East now look. And after all, Prime Minister Erdogan, when he was still mayor of Istanbul, quipped that democracy is like a streetcar. You ride it as far as you need, and then you get off. And there's every indication that perhaps that is where we are right now. Now remember, in November 2002, the AKP, the Justice and Development Party, won the election. They won about 32, 33 percent of the vote, but because Turkey has a threshold whereby Every party has to get at least 10% of the vote to enter parliament. And if they don't, they simply don't enter parliament and their votes are redistribu redistributed to those that do pass the 10% threshold. Even though they won 32% of the votes, they got 66% of the seats, a supermajority. They won subsequent elections, and I presented here before about some of the backroom dealing and the financial dealing especially the money laundering and so forth, which go in. The AKP, in their first year of governance, the Turkish statistics showed that the net error in the Turkish Central Bank went from about $600 million to around $5 billion. The net error is money which has entered the system, um, which can't be explained by any legal mechanisms. Some people would say, oh, that's just cigarette smuggling, but it doesn't show the huge leap in the first year after the AKP took power. And over the last year, you've again had a record amount of money that has flowed into Turkey, which seemingly can't be accounted for, but which all tends to flow into AKP constituent uh, services and so forth, giving them a competitive edge. A lot of people in the region will say it's actually not so much Saudi money, although that's a part, but cuttery money. And that brings up a whole other issue because oftentimes uh, as we try to lead from behind in foreign policy, whether it's in Libya or Syria or elsewhere, we tend to work through Qatar, forgetting that that country, while they do host uh, the United States and our CENTCOM presence in the Persian Gulf, they do have their a very particular agenda. But if we look at Turkey today, last month passed an important threshold in Turkey. One out of every five Turkish generals is now in prison. That's an amazing figure when you come to think about it. Uh, and what's also quite amazing is while there's all sorts of elaborate uh, allegations of coup plots which are out there, most of which don't really pass the smell test. After all, there was a, um, I wouldn't even call it a war game, just a discussion of scenarios at Hudson Institute in which people talked about what if this happens, what if that happens, how might things react, normal think tank business. And yet this was entered into evidence as a plot that the neocons at Hudson Institute were in cahoots with the military to create a plot. Now the important thing with regard to the Turkish judiciary, of course, is they don't really have a, a mechanism for bail. So once there is an allegation, once someone is arrested, it can be years before they actually see the inside of a courtroom or hear the former ch formal charges against them. I heard some statistics recently out of Turkey that in many countries when someone is arrested, usually they're either released from prison rather quickly 
or there's a 90 some odd percent conviction rate. With regard to Turks, only about 35 to 40 percent of those who are arrested and spend years in jail are ever ultimately found guilty of any offense. There simply isn't a mechanism for bail. And yet, the former head of the Turkish general staff with whom uh, the Turks partnered, with whom we partnered, is accused of running a terrorist organization. In effect, that would mean that the Turkish military is a terrorist organization. That's an unfortunate characterization. Now, one of the major problems which we see now in Turkey is that now that Prime Minister Erdogan and the AKP have won their third election, whereas after their first election, they focused primarily on the economy, which was in trouble. In their second election, they looked at some fundamental political reforms. Now, with Erdogan very much entrenched, they seem to be pursuing a both a vendetta against anyone who has opposed Erdogan in the past, and also a social agenda. For example, the person who dared challenge run against Erdogan for um, the mayor of Istanbul, the mayoralty of Istanbul, a couple decades ago, Erdogan is accused of being part of this plot. He's since fled. He's surfaced recently in Germany. Uh, Turkey requested an Interpol notice be put out for him, and Interpol decided that there simply wasn't any evidence to merit putting out a red notice on this former chancellor of a university who, even in recent years, had clashed with Erdogan with regard to the Islamic headscarf and so forth. Um, Turkey and Erdogan have been going after specifically many of the generals alleging that they've taken part in past coup attempts. And while I'm not going to defend Turkish coups, it's important to recognize that Article 35 of the Turkish Armed Service Internal Service Code of 1961 said that it's the duty of the armed forces to protect and safeguard Turkish territory in the Turkish Republic as stipulated by the Constitution. Traditionally, this meant that the military would see itself as being the major check against abuse of power. And this is why, for example, in 1997, without a shot being power, uh, fired, the Turkish military suggested that the Islamic government in the t at the time was violating the Constitution. This led to its resignation. All those who have now participated in this have been indicted, and much more worryingly, they have started not only going after military officials, but also after civilians. Separately, just as a side note, after I wrote quit, uh, critically of Egemen Bosch, who's Turkey's Minister for European Union Integration, I got court papers delivered to AEI saying that he wanted to sue me and I should never go to Turkey again. The next day he spoke about how Turks pride free speech. At any rate, so be it. When we go to the social agenda, just in recent months, here is what Prime Minister Erdogan has done. He's banned by fiat just two weeks before they were supposed to begin co-ed summer camps. No longer at summer camps can boys and girls swim together, uh, do basic things. This suggests much something much more akin to the Saudi perspective of Islam than a more plural perspective of Islam. Lebanese singers who were invited to perform on Turkish television have complained that the Turks said that they weren't properly dressed. They made one person wear, one guitar folk singer wear a tablecloth over her shoulders because they didn't like the fact that she had bare shoulders. On Lebanese television, on Egyptian television, it wasn't a problem. On Turkish television, suddenly this more conservative perspective of Islam is. There's been a lot in some American papers with regard to the abortion debate in Turkey. I'm not going to get into that. What I would say is it's rather bizarre that Prime Minister Erdogan has been ranting and raving about cesarean sections and how performing a cesarean section is interfering with God's will. I mean, I tend to take this personally because my wife was in a position that I wouldn't have a wife and a baby girl today if we didn't have a very medically necessary C-section after 19 hours of labor. Beer taxes are up 700%. Um, they have scrapped age limits on Quran classes. The age limits were initially implemented to prevent indoctrination. There was a basically a chart which said you can't start Quran classes until you're six years old, basically equivalent of some, um, Sunday school. And at this age, you have a limit of so much time, one hour a week. At this age, you have a limit of two hours a week. At this age, you have a limit of four hours a week, and so forth. There's nothing wrong with religiosity. Well, the problem is 
now that by banning the age limits and also banning the, um, the regulation of who teaches them, you bring in the opportunity in which young kids will be indoctrinated basically by those coming in from Saudi Arabia. And Prime Minister Erdogan has said in a political debate about two months ago uh, in response to opposition accusations that he was trying to Islamist society, he said, my goal isn't to create an atheist generation. My goal is to reverse that and make a generation that's in tune with Islamic values. And it, it's a pretty blatant explanation of where he seeks to go. And along this line, while we talk about madrasas and Islamic seminaries, for example, in Pakistan, the Turkish equivalent is something called the Imam Hatip schools. Uh, now, with Turkish university exams, one had to have certain prerequisites to get into a traditional liberal arts university, uh, many of which serve as feeders for the government. What the Erdogan administration has done is two things. They've scrapped those, um, those admissions requirements, so you can now enter a university without having taken basic Western um, subjects like history, art, mathematics, science, and so forth. And at the same time, he's actually changed the coefficient by which exam results are calculated in order to prioritize Imam Hatip students uh, in some perverse notion of re religious affirmative action. This means that even if there's a change in government, you're going to have a whole generation of religious students who don't have a firm basis in Western liberal education entering the Turkish bureaucracy. Now, with regard to issues that should be of much more concern to the United States and our national security, the Erdogan administration is seeking not only the use of American drones, and this has been controversial recently after um, a hit that killed 30 some odd Kurdish civilians along the Iraqi border, but they're actually seeking the sale of U.S. drones. It seems that the Obama administration is impervious uh, to certain lessons. Turkey makes no secret of its desire to bolster its own domestic armament industry. I'm President Obama is providing Erdogan with the same exact technology which Turkey now seeks to manufacture. It should come as no surprise that in recent days, Turkey has bragged that it has reaped billions of dollars selling advanced weaponry, specifically to the Middle East and to Arab countries. This also comes into play when we worry about our traditional calculations of qualitative military edge. Um, to make sure that Israel is secure against some of its more radical neighbors, including increasingly Egypt. The F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is another problem which should loom on the horizon. As you know, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is meant to be our next generation aircraft, um, our platform that should secure that American air power is going to rely upon for another generation or two. Well, it's being built in conjunction with a wide coalition, including Turkey. Turkey is involved in helping construct its, um, I mean, basically its fuselage, but isn't involved in its software, in its stealth technology, or anything like that. Turkey wants to buy 100 F-35 Joint Strike Fighters and is demanding that we turn over the codes so that they can help um, manipulate the software according to their own needs and so forth. Rather than take the basic model, they want the most advanced model. Now, the danger here is Turkey is threatened to publicly attack both Cyprus and Israel, and at the same time, one thing which is giving people in the intelligence community uh, a headache is the person of Hakan Fidan, who's the new head for the last year or so, year and a half, of Turkish intelligence. He is an unabashed supporter of Iran, a sympathizer with the Islamic Republic of Iran, and as Turkey jails many of the more pro-secular generals, and as it changes the character of intelligence, we have a real problem on our hands if we turn over our latest technology to the, um, uh, to the Turks, who might in turn turn it over to the Iranians, the Pakistanis, the Chinese, or others, despite saying they're our NATO partner. Now, Turkey, and when I've talked in Congress before, people have pointed out Turkey is host to our anti-ballistic, um, our, our anti-ballistic missile radar site, but again, it's important to look at the details. In English, they will say, yes, we are a partner of the United States, and certainly Secretary of State Clinton and Defense Secretary Panetta will praise Turkey for that. However, Ahmed Davatalu said in Turkey that our agreement with the United States is only for two years, 
after which we can shut this thing down. And so there's a question about whether they're using this in a mechanism which is going to win them long-term gain in terms of American technology, but not do anything for our own national security. Other issues that are going on, Turkey's um, renewed push for European Union membership in light of the French elections. I've been cynical about Turkey's approach to the European Union, and in fact, Turks increasingly are. When they were talking to Bulgaria recently, and Bulgaria chided them for their actions on the Mavi Marmara, which by the way, the second anniversary of that was yesterday, and they announced that they intend to use the same ship to again run the blockade. The Turkish foreign, um, the Bulgarian foreign minister said, look, I mean, this was really your fault, and the United Nations agreed it's your fault. And so what did the Turkish government say? Well, it's because the Turkish foreign minister had Jewish blood in him that he was stating this. This came out in the Turkish, um, the Turkish newspapers, in Turkish, not in English. Um, we also have issues with regard to um, the Turkish court decision against the Israeli government to indict both senior officials and others uh, who took part in this commando operation. I mean, that's just showing where the Turkish foreign policy is heading and suggesting it really a deep-seated hatred um, that's ideologically based and religiously based. Because remember, Prime Minister Erdogan publicly defended Yasin al-Qadi, who um, was an al-Qaeda financier, according to both the United Nations and the US Treasury Department, after his aide was caught giving a couple hundred thousand dollars to him. He's publicly embraced um, Omar al-Bashir immediately after he was indicted for genocide. And when he decided to engage with Hamas, which is another debate, you probably know where I stand on it, he, he would say, well, Hamas won an election. But he didn't embrace the Hamas leadership in Gaza. He embraced Khalid Mashal, the Damascus-based head, who's the most militant and unrepentant repentant in terms of, of terrorism. So as we look ahead, it seems that Turkey is accelerating the changes in its policy. And at the same time, as I conclude, I would say there are specific issues that loom for American national security, the drones, the F-35, which we should be paying a great deal more attention to. And just one side note to put on my nerd hat. Guys, aside from some National Guard units in the United States, do you guys know who's the only country that flies, that still flies the F-14, which at one point was Iran? Because we were giving them sales of Iran right before the revolution, irregardless of what was looming on the horizon. Arguably, we might, I mean, right now the F-14, it's a thing of the past, but we may not want to make the same mistake with stealth technology. Thank you. Hi, where do you see uh, Turkey headed in terms of s what's going on in Syria? They've made some noises, but they haven't really made any action. Okay, um, Turkey's been making noises about Syria, not taking action, and that's absolutely correct. It's important to recognize the cynicism of Erdogan. Back in 2007, he was embracing Bashar al-Assad. He actually invited him to vacation. Uh, they wanted to vacation together in Bodrum, and when Erdogan met with the Syrian um, prime minister. He said on the same day he just didn't have time in his schedule to meet with the Israelis who had also requested a meeting. Now why isn't it that Turkey is becoming more proactive on Syria now that Turkey seems to have genuinely changed sides? I think this actually has a lot to do, and actually, sorry, let me back up, because there's a great deal of hope that if the United States is, if there is going to be any sort of military intervention inside Syria, that it's going to involve basically a repeat of 1991 in Iraq, where you had Operation Provide Comfort, which led to the safe haven along the Turkish frontier in what today is Iraqi Kurdistan. The problem with regard to any parallel Syrian safe haven is, especially in northeastern Syria, that's where many of the Kurds live. Remember, Abdullah Ajlan, the head of the PKK, which the Americans and Europeans define as a terrorist group, long lived in Syria. When I talk to Kurds both in Iraq and also Kurdish emigres in Germany and London, their estimates are that between 60 and 90 percent of Syrian Kurds actively support the PKK. The remainder support Masoud Barzani in Iraq and the Kurdistan Democratic Party. This means that the Turks, I mean the Turks know this and don't want to open a can of worms where they could in effect worsen their own domestic insurgency. Thank you. Um, yeah. 
Uh, speaking of the Kurds, I was wondering, I've read that the Kurdish population is actually growing relative to the Turkish population. Are they as uh, Islamist as the Turks are? Are they more friendly? I mean, certainly in Iraq, they're more friendly towards the U.S. Okay, um, with regard to the last point, let me just make a tangential note and then I'll go to the heart of your question. It doesn't matter who is pro-U.S. or not. Um, when the United States is seen as weak, people will make their accommodation with whomever they need to um, make it with. Last week, the Iranian Consul General in, in Soleimaniya, Iraq, in Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, gave the statistics, which I actually confirmed with someone in the Dawa party, that 70% of Iran's trade with Iraq right now is with Iraqi Kurdistan specifically. The Americans are no longer there, and therefore the Kurds are m pivoting and making their accommodation with whomever they need to make their accommodation with. With regard to the demographics in Turkey, um, it's not so, first of all, while the Kurds, especially the Kurds in Iraq, will oftentimes make a nationalist argument, the, to put on my history cap for a second, and what I like to say is I'm a historian by training, so I get paid to predict the past. I usually get it right about 50% of the time. But one thing I'm certain about, although it doesn't really make me popular in Iraqi Kurdistan, is when one talks about the Kurdish uprisings in the wake of World War I uh, and in the 1920s and so forth, they were much more religious uprisings than they were nationalist uprisings. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the Kurds failed to, uh, to win their state in the 1920s. Now, it is true that demographically you have a rising Kurdish population, but the way the Turks would describe it, and I think what's more relevant, is you have a rising Anatolian population, both Kurds and Turks inside, um, I mean basically in the Asian side of Turkey. The President Abdullah Gul is from Kayseri, which is in the center of Anatolia, is traditionally a um, very religious city and so forth. And in this part, I mean, what a lot of the Turkish liberals will say is demographically, I mean, uh, we've had it. Demography has a habit of turning around. The birth rate in Iran, for example, I think I said in my last appearance here, is half of what it was in the 1980s. The question that we should put forward going, recognizing the problem of demography is that even if we want to loosen the control of the military inside Turkish politics, and I think it's a noble idea to do so, as I read in my presentation, Article 35, the traditional role of the Turkish military is to be defend the Constitution. It would be reckless to loosen the Turkish military's controls as the guarantors of the Constitution without creating an alternate check and balance system. Now, Turkey is what I've, the major point, which I forgot to, um, embarrassingly mentioned in my presentation, is that Erdogan is seeking right now to draft a new const constitution. He says that he's going to consult with everyone, but press practice shows that consult means telling them, not necessarily winning consensus. In a situation like that, we are doing absolutely nothing to ensure that in this new constitution there are checks and balances. And here we might actually see Turkey following the Egyptian model, or vice versa, as we have a Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt dominating the parliament, tasked with writing a new constitution, even if Ahmed Shafiq happens to win the next election. Uh, we have time for one more short question and short answer. Short answer, sorry. Um, over on the left. Turkey recently uh, downgraded ties with Israel. Do you see any chance that they would cut them completely and uh, possibly even start funding the other side? Well, Turkey already is funding the other side. That's no secret. The flashpoint is with regard to the oil and gas fields off the, in the eastern Mediterranean off the coast of Cyprus, which Greek Cy Cyprus and Israel are jointly trying to exploit. The Turkish Navy is threatened to take action against anyone that drills in that region, and the Turks may believe that if they make the, enough noise, the U.S. policy position, which was actually put forward by one of, um, uh, in a different setting by one of Romney's Middle East advisors, is that we shouldn't encourage development of this oil field until all the geopolitics are settled. And that's just a, I mean, that, that basically will allow Turkey to kick the can down the road a little bit too long. Separately, I mean, one other point of diplomatic leverage we have is if Turkey complains so much about occupation, maybe it's time to end the last occupation in Europe, which is the occupation of Cyprus since 1974.